Hi friends, welcome to another segment of Zeal Theological Ministry. My name is Harold Massey, I'm a teaching minister, and Zeal Theological Ministry is based off of Romans 12, that is to be better informed of him, so we can be better transformed by him. Now friends, I'm quite glad to be back with you again this week. As some of you know, I've been traveling quite a bit, and those moments are always quite important to me, which I'll explain. Uh, I had the opportunity to visit, as with most of my visits, to visit many churches, uh, speak with many ministers and their congregants, to get a glimpse of the burdens on their hearts and their unique congregations, pray with them and fellowship with them and their people from all different walks of life, uh, all while practically sharing the reality of the, the world and their worldviews, not only with my family, but ministerially uh, in all that we do. In most ecclesiological and church circles, the growing iso isolationism seems to be only getting worse. Isolation can occur, and it often occurs due to disagreements with neighbors, families, doctrine, uh, fear of receiving condemnation from people that hold opposing views, and also a growing spiritual indolence or comfortable laziness is what I call it within churches where their leaders and ministers haven't sought out accountability to continually equip themselves and thus they in turn are restricting their congregants in such a manner so that their congregants still view them and their leaders and their ministers as those that possess a great stature and knowledge. Now, uh, these isolated church environments are quite problematic since it's a subtle method of training their churches to be critical of everyone else and every other church except themselves. It's a distorted discernment, really, which is about critically looking at everything and everyone except the, the appearing within their own walls. Uh, in order for a group to be isolationist, uh, a hero is usually in the driver's seat, and we'll put that in quotes, a hero. And if you look across the churches that operate in isolationism, it is due to some form of hero worship. And this isn't just some issue that takes birth in, uh, in family, community, traditionalist, or postmodern churches. This has been occurring from the days of the early apostolic era and has continued today. Uh, it's one of the prevalent reasons why we have most of the letters to the churches in the New Testament. Most eventually departed from being well-reasoned and faithful churches due to the direct failure of their leadership. And in our previous segment, which was the introduction to 1 Thessalonians and its context, we did cover that Paul's letter to the Thessalonians was unique in uh, its theme, so thematically it was unique, since they were quite dear to him. He does later correct some secondary issues infiltrating the church, but not with the same urgency or the same urgent reproach as he did with many other churches. So we'll continue our discourse uh, after our scripture reading for today. I'll be reading out of the ESV translation if you'd like to fo follow along word for word. And uh, I'll be reading 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, as to we're in chapter 2 today verses 1 through 12. Now, if you know, sometimes we occasionally do this. Ideologically, we'll capture the entirety of the chapter since this specific chapter shows us the intimacy between Paul and the Thessalonians. So although it's got 20 verses and we're reading only 12, we'll cover the entirety of it ideologically. So our contextual extrapolation will just be a continuity from what we've already covered in our previous segment of Thessalonians. Uh, now, the title of today's discourse, for those of you that like taking notes, is Trailblazers in an Emblazed Trail. So let's read the passages together and pray and continue. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive, 
but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is our witness. Nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil, we worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaimed to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct towards you believers. For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, we just thank you and praise you that we have another humble moment where we get to extrapolate and read through and just ponder and, uh, and, and, and study through the words that you provided to us through your amanuensis, the Apostle Paul. And Lord, we thank you through these lessons that we also understand that you, are, uh, you were speaking specifically and you're speaking specifically to the church at large as well, Lord, that there are lessons for us to extrapolate and to know you more and to understand you more. So I pray, Lord, that from this segment, may we understand your word more, may it reveal more of who you are, and may our devotion to you and our awe-inspired worship to you increase as well. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now, folks, as I briefly mentioned earlier, uh, the chapter at hand today is really uh, an intimate and a heartfelt po portion in Paul's letter to the church uh, in Thessalonica. However, in typical Pauline fashion, and most of you that follow these segments, you will have uh, understood this by now too. Even though it's a heartfelt and passionate and a passionate letter to this beloved church of his, in, in typical Pauline fashion, even his intimacy is logical, evidenced, and reason. So today's lesson uh, will be a bit more practical as we view a part of the Apostle Paul's heart, along with what seems to be heavy on the heart of the church at large today as well. Uh, these can be quite uh, big discussions, so I have made my best effort to ensure this lesson would be brief while simultaneously bringing clarity through a form of simplicity. I'll tell you from personal experience, and uh, every one of my seminarian and academician uh, friends would echo the same sentiment. As we grow in the depths of certain subjects, it's the bright minds that can provide robust, complete, and long discourses on several topics and subjects. However, it is the truly wise that possess a deep and robust understanding of a subject that can provide clarity through simplicity. That's the reason why every single discourse that we push out has a very intentional title, which is expanded through the exhortation of its message. Uh, most of you have probably noticed that by now. There's an old amusing story that some of you may know that I'd like to share with you as we proceed. It's about a minister of a small church in a rural town that was he was uh, who was making his farewell visits to his congregation members, his soon-to-be former congregation members, as he was moving to a new church. Now, often when you first meet someone, uh, or in a farewell meeting, or even in any intimate meeting at all, the sentiment is usually the same. Observationally, we can call this an exaggerated flattery. That's what I call it. Most people would rather avoid confrontation or conflict in an intimate setting. So, as the minister was visiting his soon-to-be former congregants, visit after visit, there was an identical theme of praise of the minister, of how well he preached, how well he led, and how much he was loved, all flattering visits. Now, <laughs> the minister decides to meet with the elderly congregants last, and finally arrived at the home of one of the oldest women in the church. To his delight, the elderly woman begins to compliment him uh, by saying that his successor, that the minister's successor, wouldn't be as good as him. 
The minister now is visibly flattered and thanks the woman, to which the woman clarifies. She says that their small church has always uh, been a revolving door of ministers that they just settled for. And in her lifetime, she's lived through six different ministers at that very church. And each one was always theologically uh, and practically worse than whom they replaced. So it's only logical that the next one would be worse. <laughs> you see, friends, ministry in churches is mostly carrying the same idealism as the world. There's a hypersensitivity towards being hypersensitive, where what is said is from a position of morphing uh, to whether it can be offensive instead of whether it is true. Now, the idea is not to intentionally attempt to offend others either, but rather this is a depiction of where titillation and flattery of the listener is of far greater importance than the actual veracity, accuracy, and validity of the message being presented. Simply put, like the minister's encounters with his congregants in the story, the failure to speak the truth was always executed and concealed by flattery. This is vital for us to see and understand the true ministry being carried out by the apostles of Christ and as seen here with the example of the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul, in his heartfelt, loving message to the Thessalonians in chapter 2, reminds them of how he and his ministry team came to them in the first place. In verse 5 of today's chapter, Paul says that he and his team never came to the Thessalonians with flattery, or rather the Greek word uniquely used here by Paul is kola keia, which is, uh, that, and it's, it's such a unique word that it isn't used anywhere else ex, uh, by Paul except for here. Now, um, kola keia is, is, is a, uh, the specific word here. Uh, we can possibly and logically speculate as to why this specific word was used uh, on this, uh, with this specific church. Now, uh, as we've covered in our contextual extraction in our previous segment, Thessalonica, or Thessaloniki as, known in the, as it was known in the Greek world, uh, was known as the mother of the great city of Macedonia, the mother of Macedonia. Since it was the prevalent uh, commercial and uh, ecumenical, uh, you can say, uh, it was a trade intersecting city uh, along the Via Ignatia Highway. This was also a city of governance by citizenry, or simply put, self-governance under the sovereignty and recognition of the Roman Empire. Their residents were influential, intellectual, well-reasoned, and quite connected to commerce and business. So I deduce that it is quite fitting that Paul uses a unique word like kolakeia that, that only the Thessalonians would truly understand appreciate and in itself point to certain evidences in their minds as they were quite connected to the world. You see, in the ancient world, as well as the time of the apostles, the best charlatans and religious deceivers were the ones who were dynamic speakers and used excessive flattery to appease people. In fact, within Greek mythology, there used to be seven winged gods of love called the erotes. Think of the influenced words, that derivative words that we have today, like uh, erotic love in the English language. And one such god of love in the seven gods that was called the erotes, one such god, uh, his name was Here Logos. Here means to please, and logos, which uh, would mean speech in that context. So a god called pleasing speech. Now, Hede Logos was always pictured in Greek paintings as drawing or steering the chariot of Aphrodite. Uh, this was a well, uh, you know, for most of you that uh, know Greek mythology, and of course in that time, Aphrodite was a well-known false deity by the Apostle Paul, as well as, um, uh, since he was, he, uh, he, uh, she was predominantly worshipped in, uh, in the city of Corinth. So he, it was quite known by Paul of who Aphrodite was. And if you remember, Corinth was where Paul stayed and pastored for quite some time. 
Um, Aphrodite was the goddess of lust and pleasure. And the Aphrodite movement, so to say, grew into a major cult eventually. Now, we can arguably make a case that the following and the rapid growth of it becoming a cult ideologically and culturally was the biggest challenge that afflicted and infiltrated one of the worst churches we encounter in the New Testament, the Corinthian church, the church at Corinth. When we encounter modern cults or cultic settings and movements, no one is a part of a cult uh, or a movement of such because they wanted to join a cult or a isolated movement. There usually is a dynamic speaker or a personality that is their chief driving force of the movement. And this individual amasses their following usually by flattery, uh, flattering speech and by voicing people's own desires or and even uh, giving false promises for their afflictions. Just like Hede Logos, is, uh, uh, Hede Logos, the, the you know, fl uh, flattering speech guy, uh, pleasing speech, just like Hede Logos, who drove in and eventually brought in the Aphrodite movement through his flattering words, this can be a corollary. The Thessalonians were quite, quite privy to, uh, and they understood these kind of dynamic fawners and flatterers, since there was another movement or cult operating in Thessalonica the cult of the Kabiri, uh, uh, also known as the Kabiros, um, that was known for its, uh, and the Kabiros and the, or the Kabiri, they were known for the excessive pleasure, uh, or orgiastic worship dances, and the appeasement of people's desires, uh, very similar to the, to the Aphrodite movement. Appeasing people's desires is how all cults initially subtly control and continually keep their people. It's quite clear that in light of what, was, uh, what the surrounding ideologies were, Paul reminds the Thessalonians about his and his team's initial motives and continual motives, that they came with an appeal and not an attempt to deceive as listed in verse 3, that they didn't come from impurity or for, or for it, but rather they had been called and approved by God, and it is God's gospel that they came to share not to please man as was in their culture, but rather to please God who doesn't test their, uh, their rituals, but their hearts, as Paul says in verse 4. If they wanted to please the Thessalonians or themselves, they would have used some form of flattering speech, which the intellectuals of Thessalonica could easily deduce and recognize as they were logical and they were well informed. Paul and his team came with the truth of the gospel that they reasoned through as we covered in chapter 1 previously and verse 5 of today. By being apostles of Christ, they could, they could have also made demands and asserted authority on the Thessalonians, but they did no such thing. In fact, they came as a nursing mother to her child, as Paul says in verse 6 and 7. Now, a nursing mother affectionately feeds, raises, and provides for the child. And similarly, Paul says that they came not only to give them the gospel, but themselves as well. He goes on to say that most false teachers, ministers, and charlatans will eventually show their true motive, which is benefiting themselves financially. To that, Paul goes on to tell them in verse 9 that they did not want to be a burden to any of their churches, including the Thessalonians. So they continued to work and labor night and day, all while simultaneously proclaiming and teaching the gospel selflessly for the gain of others. They were, simply put, they were bivocational um, and uh, not a burden to ministry, but instead gave ministry their all. Now, uh, in doing so, Paul beautifully depicts the image uh, of them being parents to the Thessalonians, being both a mother in feeding and raising, as well as a father in being an example through their conduct on how they encouraged, directed, or charged their children, the church at Thessalonica, to walk in a manner worthy of God, as Paul lists in verse 11. Friends, this is perhaps the most important parenting lesson for us to extract from the riches of Scripture. You see, most Christian parenting uh, 
uh, has been simply uh, ideological quotations from Proverbs 22, 6. You'll probably recognize it as soon as I read it. It says, train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. You know, most generations simply threw a rule book at their children and expected them to blindly follow their do's and don'ts list. For illustrative purposes, if I had a heart condition that required corrective surgery, well, quite honestly, I'm not going to go to a mechanic, no matter how great of a mechanic he is. I would go to a cardiothoracic surgeon, and in all honesty, not just uh, any CT surgeon, but I would want to know that he's successfully been in other hearts before. The same can be said about raising and training our children. We cannot tell them to follow the scriptures if we don't follow it ourselves. We cannot tell them to humbly search the depths if they ha they've never seen us do it as well. And we cannot tell them to go somewhere if we have no knowledge of it or have never been there ourselves. And the churches in isolation are a danger to themselves and their proceeding generations. It may seem profound if ministers of these churches even write books, preach many sermons, compose music, and so on. But doing so in isolation is, quite frankly, self-applause and self-glorification. That is antithetical to the gospel message, as Paul says in verse 10 of today, that not only did they bring the gospel, their life was a witness, evidence, and matched it. They were spiritual parents who were what they wanted their children. They were already what they wanted their children to be. We didn't read it today, but uh, the same idea is echoed again by Paul in verses 13 and 14. That the Thessalonians didn't just accept a rule book, but they came to reasonably accept um, uh, what the apostles brought as the very word of God and saw it in action in the lives of the apostles, in their conduct. They knew the afflictions Paul and his team faced on their way to Thessalonica in the first place. Brutally beaten, uh, they were be uh, beaten beyond measure, incarcerated, false accus accusations made against them, and also illegally uh, punished and uh, by, despite their Roman citizenship, um, which gave them rights to a fair judicial process, but even that was violated. And this was all done in Philippi. Paul mentions this uh, in verse 2 of today, but also recounts their afflictions in verse 14 to his beloved church. Since we know that the Thessalonian church, through the power of the gospel, began to evangelize uh, all over, so even in their surrounding cities and, uh, and uh, major intersections. But in doing so, they, in, in their evangelism, they, uh, it, they weren't just converted by the power of the gospel that made them evangelize over. But in doing so, they became imitators, in a sense, of Paul and the churches where Christ is the head. However, in evangelism, if it's sincere and truthful, it will always usually meet retaliation as well which Paul mentions that the Thessalonians faced from their own native countrymen in verse 14. But this too is an encouragement to the fact that the Thessalonians are carrying the same truth carried by the apostles, not as flattering speech or to please men, but rather to please God. You know, friends, if you ask my family and close friends, they'll bear witness to what I'm about to share with you. I experience animosity and hostility uh, all the time because we believe in the sufficiency of Scripture and the Word of God being the final authority. There are many occasions for those that are called to this life of hostility, so to say, where it can be discouraging. Uh, there can be a feeling of hopelessness at times and just a heart that can seasonally be weary as well. So. Uh, I think in his pastoral and parental chapter, which is chapter two of the First Thessalonians, Paul writes to his uh, where Paul writes to his dear church. I think it's 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 quite uh, f uh, befitting that he ends it uh, with the, with this pastoral plea and uh, and this encouragement that pe uh, you know people often look back at Paul's life uh, retrospectively l l looking at his life. People often often look back at Paul's life and call him a trailblazer to the Gentile world for the, you know, for the gospel. However, Paul reminds us in verse 12 
that the emblazed trail of truth is a trail that leads to the glorious kingdom of God. And the trail that we've been called to walk upon has been established by the very steps of Christ who showed us how to walk. The trail that should have led to our death, he walked, Christ walked, and gave himself up upon that cross. And those that follow him must bear the cross of their own sins. For the same Christ who gave his life up up upon that cross was raised from the dead, so you too may be raised to life in him. Understanding his work, walking as he walked, is walking in a manner worthy of him. As Paul writes in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So yes, this walk in him will often bring retaliation, animosity, discomfort, danger, affliction, suffering, and so on. But as the Apostle Paul pastorally and, in, uh, and through encouragement, reminds the Thessalonians and to us, the church at large, in verse, uh, verse 19, that our joy, crown, and hope is anchored on what is to come, the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, uh, G.K. Chesterton, Gilbert Keith Chesterton, once said, uh, which I'll paraphrase uh, to make it less philosophical and academic, in the abundance of comfort and isolation, the idea of hope is truly foolish. It may, it's just a, a proverb even. And most assuredly, it is certainly a flattery to oneself. It is only when everything is hopeless that hope begins to be something that one is truly hopeful about. So folks, as we begin to close, I didn't get a chance to speak to you in terms of what has been weighing on the hearts of our entire nation, Christians or not. And that is in uh, regards to the decision of the Supreme Court uh, in this historic decision, uh, which was Roe v. Wade. Now, I won't take too much of your time and go in depth uh, of, about the intricacies uh, in regards to this topic. However, I would like to briefly address this with you for not addressing it would be a ecclesiological failure. If you'd like to expand more uh, or provided, uh, if you'd like us to expand more on this topic or uh, even give you a deeper discussion in regards to many of the questions and arguments raised on each side, feel free to reach out to us. Or uh, if enough of you would prefer, uh, we can dedicate a ministry team discussion topic like we do sometimes, uh, specifically in regards to this as well. It might give us the opportunity to discuss, uh, and if we do a, a, a dedicated discussion, a discussion uh, session, it, it can possibly give us an opportunity to discuss any forthcoming developments from the executive branch uh, as well. That is uh, President Biden's recent executive order. Uh, I'd like to speak to you first, fellow Christians. Do not let anyone guilt you into thinking you cannot reasonably rejoice in this recent decision responsibly. In the course of this 50 plus year decision made previously by the Supreme Court, the U.S. has conducted over 60 billion abortions, not a clump of cells, not dehumanizing terms like embryos and uh, zygotes and fetuses and uh, et cetera. So it's, it's like a means to soften the language. These are simply scientific terms for the developmental stages of a human being. Does it respond? One, we need to ask ourselves these questions when we, when we say these things, when, we, when these terms are said. Does it respond to external stimuli? Does it grow? Does it convert nutrients into development and energy? This, the scientific answer to all of them is yes in regards to conception. And thus, the conception is scientifically categorized as a living being. But Christians, remember Paul's words from Romans 12 as well. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. It is absolutely unnecessary to see some Christians blatantly rejoicing in the faces uh, as they're mocking uh, in, in a mocking fashion uh, and rejoicing in the faces of those who are deeply confused, hurting and afflicted by this. Uh, is, is it true rejoicing when you know someone's deeply hurt 
by this. Again, rejoice with those who are rejoicing. This is a big win for morality. But at the same time, those who are angry, bitter, hostile, loud, and scared by this, pray for them. See if you can assist them in understanding this rationally. If they're not ready, give them some time. You do not have to match volumes. A gentle tone is what you may prefer from them, but have they seen any gentleness in us at all? And to those who have been or leaned towards the pro-choice argument, there seems to be an abundance of analogies and metaphors and hypothetical worst-case scenarios uh, that are being propagated mostly. I would implore you to ask yourselves, have you actually read the official discourse decision outlined from the Supreme Court? The biggest talking points uh, have always been that all justices shouldn't be interfering with women's choices. In one way, the Supreme Court has agreed with that logic, that they interfered 50 years ago, and that was a mistake. We're in a society where no one admits that they're wrong morally or circumstantially. And if one of three powers in the U.S. can admit that they were wrong 50 years ago, shouldn't that implore Americans to maybe possibly think rationally uh, about whether they've been wrong about what was declared right previously? I promised I wouldn't prolong this, so as we close today, uh, I, I do want to address this topic through the lenses of our lesson of today's chapter as well. You're probably hearing a blaring call for the church to do, uh, to do more at this time and that since the church is, has always been and is pro-life, they better be ready to increase their scale of care. I'd like to be quite clear about what I'm about to say, so please bear with me. I'm the biggest critic of the church because I love the Church of Christ, of whom he is the head. The only reason we have hospitals, orphanages, crisis centers, provision drives, and so on was because and is because of the church. In fact, going into... Uh, go, uh, you know, just getting to a hospital or the hospital existing, it, historically, it was non-existent. As we've covered in some of our lessons of previous civilizations, doctors were property, they were slaves, uh, although most were well tra uh, treated well. It was a private affair for the wealthy. It is the church that brought hospitals to the public. That's, that's why most of the hospitals are named after Christian denominations or missionaries. Now, if hospitals have merged into businesses, that's not because of Christianity. Remember, the Christians brought hospitals to the masses. The church has always been benevolent to the world. However, this only applies to the faithful churches, and let me be very clear. Like we mentioned earlier, churches in isolation not only have no impact on the world, but they don't help faithful churches carry any of these burdens either. So it's time to truly introspectively see if your church is isolated a holy Sunday hangout with familiars, or a bless me club. And if you honestly see that it is, consider supporting churches that are truly making an impact in society. If you'd like to help, so if you'd like to help, help many of these churches that are truly making an impact, you know, please reach out to us uh, so we can provide these resources to you, and even if you'd like to research these resources. For remember, the trail... Uh, has been emblazed by Christ, which leads into his arms, the arms of kingdom and glory. And in imitating him, we are imitating the trailblazer as we walk in his trail. The church, who must be seen as trailblazers, walking in an emblazed trail. It is time that we became godly parents to the world again. And this be begins by being godly mothers and fathers of our home first, then our families, our communities, and our workplaces, and so on. Friends, I know this is a difficult topic, and there's more that could be said about it, but we need it, uh, there has to be these moments where we address them. And if your pastor has not addressed what weighs on the heart of everyone, um, you know, these pressing matters, then I would, uh, I would strongly suggest and implore you to seek counsel from from someone else that can help you think through these topics rationally. And of course, you are always welcome to reach out to us as well. So God bless you all, and let us pray as we close this segment out. Heavenly Father, we just thank you and praise you for another lesson that we were able to 
go through. We thank you for the richness of your word, and we thank you for your everlasting faithfulness, Lord. Lord, forgive us through because of our rebellion, active or passive, Lord. Lord, and I pray that your Holy Spirit takes control of our deepest, innermost sanctum, and that through that sanctum, you can do your good works that glorifies yourself. Lord, I pray for the people that hear this message and even hear the the devotional and pastoral plea at the end, Lord. I pray that it's interpreted in a way that they understand your heart, Lord, that what you want for us before we were saved by you through, through your work, through your spirit, because of the work of your son, and we're saved to him, Lord. So we thank you for everything that you're doing and you will continue to do. And we thank you that we know you. In Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Friends, I'll see you next time.